Let's take everything we know about how a derivative affects the shape of the original function's graph into sketching the graph of this function. So f of x equals 1 plus 1 over x plus 1 over x squared. If you put these all over a common denominator, you get x squared plus x plus 1 over x squared. And the features of the graph that we want to accurately represent are the minimums and the maximums, any inflection points, and also any asymptotes that this function might have. Um, before we start working with this function, we should probably know what its domain is, just so we know what x values we need to pay attention to. And we can't divide by 0, so for the domain of this function, it's everything except 0. Now often, at, plate, at holes in the domain, you get an asymptote. So we should check what exactly happens to this function when x gets close to 0, uh, because we want to know if it's an asymptote or not. So to figure that out, let's take the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared plus x plus 1 over x squared. And uh, what you see is in the numerator, the parts with x are getting very small, and the plus 1 is staying at about 1. And in the denominator, well, x squared, since x is going to 0, x squared is, is small, but always positive because it's squared. And 1 over a small positive is a big positive. So that means this limit is plus infinity. So at x equals 0, we do get an asymptote, a vertical asymptote. All right. So that's one thing that'll be on our graph. Now let's calculate where minimums and maximums occur. That is, where are critical values? For this function. So to know that, we're going to need a derivative. And the derivative of this function is minus x to the minus second minus 2x to the minus third. Just as a reminder, the original function was 1 plus 1 over x plus 1 over x squared. So we, I calculated this derivative using the power rule. Um, one thing to note is, oh, I missed a minus sign on this exponent. <clears throat> one thing to note about this derivative function is that this is undefined only at x equals 0. But that's where the original function was undefined. So we don't really get an extra critical point at x equals 0. Um, OK, to find other critical points, we need to set this equal to 0 and see what we get. So minus x to the minus second minus 2x to the minus third equals 0. To solve this equation, I'm going to multiply both sides by x cubed. Of course, on the left-hand side, that just makes it 0 again. On the right-hand side, we get, after distributing this x cubed and simplifying the exponents, we get minus x minus 2. And that means that x is minus 2. So this is a critical value. Okay, since we want, it might be a local minimum or a local maximum, and either way we're going to want to plot this point accurately on our graph. So let's evaluate our original function at minus 2. We get 1 plus 1 over negative 2 plus 1 over negative 2 squared. So 1 minus a half plus a quarter, that's 3 quarters. OK. Uh, we should also, as long, uh, since we have the derivative here, we should also figure out where is the derivative positive and negative, so we can figure out where is the original function increasing and decreasing. So let's draw a sign chart for f prime. So we know that 0 is not in the domain of this function. So let's indicate that there's a hole in the domain there. And we know at minus 2 
the first derivative is 0. All right, all we need to do is figure out on these other intervals from negative infinity to minus 2, from minus 2 to 0, and from 0 up to infinity, uh, is the first derivative positive or negative on these intervals? So we can just plug in some numbers. We could plug in 1 and minus 1 and say minus 3. I'll let you do the arithmetic on that, but the signs that you get are negative from 0 to infinity, uh, positive from negative 2 to 0, and negative again from negative infinity to minus 2. So using this sign chart, we, can, we know that f is increasing only on the interval from minus 2 to 0. And it's decreasing everywhere else, from minus infinity to minus 2, and also, so union, uh, 0 up to infinity. All right, so now we know where the function is increasing and decreasing. And we also know that we have a critical point at x equals minus 2 and y equals 3 over 4. Notice that since our critical point, at our critical point, the first derivative changes from negative to positive. So that means this critical point is actually a local minimum using the first derivative test. Okay, now let's see if we can find some inflection points. Let me get some fresh screen here. Okay, so now let's find inflection points. And of course, while we're at it, we'll also figure out where the function is concave up and concave down. Okay, so remember our original function was 1 plus 1 over x plus 1 over x squared. And our first derivative was negative 1, let me write it this way, negative x to the minus second minus 2 times x to the minus third. And that's the first derivative, not the second derivative. Okay, now we need to calculate our second derivative. Just take one more derivative. We get 2 times x to the minus third plus 6 times x to the minus fourth. Again, this is undefined at 0, which is no surprise since the original function was undefined at 0. To find Inflection points, we can set this equal to 0. So 0 equals 2x to the minus third plus 6x to the minus fourth. To solve this equation, just like with our critical point equation, we need to multiply both sides. And this time, we're going to multiply both sides by x to the fourth. And then on the left-hand side, distribute, sorry, right-hand side, distribute x to the fourth. On the right-hand side, we get 2 times x plus 6. And on the left hand side, we get 0. And solving this equation for x, we get that x is minus 3. So this is going to be an inflection point. Just to know what, uh, where this point actually is, let's evaluate the original function at minus 3. We get 1 plus 1 over negative 3 plus 1 over negative 3 squared. So 1 minus a third is 2 thirds, which is 6 ninths, plus a ninth is 7 ninths. OK, so there's our inflection point. To figure out where this graph is concave up and concave down, let's build a sign chart for the second derivative. OK, so we know at negative 3, the second derivative is 0. We know at 0, the second derivative is undefined. All right. 
Now we can just take some x values on these intervals in between, say 1 and minus 1 and minus 4, plug these into the second derivative to see if the second derivative is positive or negative at these x values. And when you do that, you'll find that it's negative from negative infinity to minus 3, it's positive from minus 3 to 0, and negative again from 0 to positive infinity. Sorry, that's not right. It's positive from 0 to positive infinity. OK, so that means that this function is concave up on the interval from minus 3 to 0, and also from 0 to infinity. We can't include 0 here because the function isn't defined as 0. And it's concave down from minus infinity up to minus 3, because that's where the second derivative is negative. OK, so so far we know where the function is increasing and decreasing. We know it has a local minimum. We found one inflection point, and we know where the function is concave up and concave down. We also found a vertical asymptote. I guess we should see if there is any horizontal asymptote. And that really amounts to checking what happens when x goes to plus or minus infinity. So remember, our original function is 1 plus 1 over x plus 1 over x squared. And when we take the limit of this as x goes to infinity, well, the parts with x's in the denominator, those just get small. Because 1 divided by something big is very small. So this limit is 1. And in fact, so that's the limit at, at plus infinity. The limit at minus infinity is exactly the same. So we do get a horizontal asymptote here at y equals 1. OK, so let's put all of this information together into a graph. We'll sketch this by hand. OK, so we know that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. That's corresponding to a hole in the domain. There is a horizontal asymptote at, at uh, x equals 1. Uh, what else? We found a local minimum at minus 2. And that was at, at minus 2 comma 3 over 4, so about here. And then at minus 3, we found an inflection point. So that's about there. It's a little too high. It was minus 3 comma 7 ninths. <clears throat> um, it's uh, also at the asymptote at 0, the vertical asymptote at 0, we found that the graph went up on both sides of this asymptote, because the limit at 0 was plus infinity, not minus infinity. So the graph has to go up on both sides. It's a little hard to tell exactly how these points all connect up, because we don't know where this graph crosses its own asymptote. So maybe what we should do is, just to see where this graph crosses the asymptote y equals 1, let's take our function, 1 plus 1 over x plus 1 over x squared, set that equal to 1, and see where this happens. So the ones cancel, so 1 over x plus 1 over x squared equals 0. Just like before, we can multiply both sides to clear the denominators. Multiply by x squared on both sides. We get x plus 1 equals 0, and so that means x is minus 1. So this function does cross its own asymptote at x equals minus 1. Let's add that to the picture right there. But it doesn't cross its asymptote anywhere else. So that means this right-hand piece for positive x values, it never actually touches the asymptote. Well, since the limit as x goes to infinity is 1, 
this graph must just curve this way and approach the asymptote. Remember that on this interval for positive x values, the graph was supposed to be concave up, and sure enough, it did come out to be concave up. Okay, so now let's start back at the asymptote at x equals 0 and work our way to the left. We know from x equals 0 down to x equals minus 2, the graph is decreasing and also concave up. I'm sorry, increasing and concave up. So from minus 2 up to the vertical asymptote, it's increasing and concave up. So it must be like this. Between minus 2 and minus 3, so starting at minus 3 and going to minus 2, it's concave up, but this time it's decreasing. So that must be like this. And then to the left of minus 3, right, the function is close to its asymptote. Notice that we know it has to be below the asymptote, because if it were above the asymptote, it would cross the asymptote, but we know it doesn't. So the graph is just below its asymptote. And we know the graph is concave down and decreasing here. So it must curve downwards and meet up with its inflection point. So there's a rough graph of what this function looks like. Now the important thing about getting a picture like this is not that this is a very accurate picture of the graph of our function. It's not a very accurate picture. If we wanted an accurate graph, we would just ask a computer to draw a graph. What's important about this sort of picture is understanding how all of the pieces, the where it's increasing and decreasing, and where it's concave up and concave down, where there are minimums, maximums, and inflection points, how all of those pieces sort of fit together to produce what the graph actually is.